So now that we reviewed some of the physiology that's involved and got ourselves all thinking on the track of what thyroid hormone does, I'd like to talk about hyperthyroid disease in the cat because this is something that you will see commonly as a veterinary practitioner. So feline hyperthyroidism was actually recognized um, in the very uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. And actually, when I started veterinary school, it was not really understood by practitioners the way that it is now because it was a newly, um, newly diagnosed disease. Uh, and so it's gone from these first clinical reports coming out to being the most common endocrinopathy in cats. So it's a very common disease now. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. It is a benign disease, fortunately. It is usually bilateral and is an adenomatous hyperplastic disease, meaning that you have small multifocal nodules throughout the thyroid gland or generalized hyperplasia. It is also usually a bilateral, as I said, so if you have it on one side, even if you can't feel an enlarged thyroid on the other side, it's either there or it will occur um, uh, very shortly after, afterwards. And what happens here in this figure is that you basically have the stimulation from the thyroid gland itself. You have these adenomatous areas throughout the thyroid gland. They've decided that they're not going to pay attention to TSH regulation. So they just produce T3 and T4 at will whenever they feel like it. And the system is not turned off because they're not paying attention to TSH. In a very few number of cats, we see carcinomas, and it's a very low percentage, as you can see. Some of them may be non-functional, so they may just be a carcinoma that is, that is not functional. And certainly in dogs, if we see a thyroid carcinoma, most of them are not functional and do not secrete excess hormones. Um, but some of them certainly can in cats, and, but it's a very, very low percentage of the disease. So most of the time, this is going to be a benign disease in cats. So how do cats get this? And this has been a question a lot of people have looked at, and it's been a hard question to investigate because this is a disease that actually occurs over um, you know, the course of 10 years. Most of the cats that get diagnosed are older, and so it's not something that really occurs with um, like an exposure to a certain um, uh, uh, stimulus. Uh, and the disease is going to occur quickly. Usually it takes a long time for it to develop. And we do believe that it's probably multifactorial. Some of the things that we think might be involved are food. Um, it's been postulated that, or, or some of the epidemiologic studies that have come out have implicated canned cat food. Um, as part of the pathogenesis, it was uh, postulated that it might be some of the plasticizer in the signs of the can that actually get into the high fat canned food uh, that we feed our cats and that that may be causing it. So that may be involved. There's some data to show that flame retardants that are present all over our households uh, that cats are exposed to because they live with us and they lick themselves and they ingest things from our carpets and our beddings. Uh, and there was some data to suggest that flame retardants might be part of the etiology of hyperthyroidism. And also flavonoids, which is um, something that is present in cat foods now that cats weren't traditionally exposed to, that now that they're eating plant-based materials as we're feeding them in commercially available cat foods, that that might be part of the etiology as well. However, the pathogenesis at this time is unknown.